Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jordan Smith. Jordan is the Investment and Transition Portfolio Manager at Spaceworks. Jordan, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for coming on. Uh, before we go too much further, I probably should say that uh, anything Jordan and I talk about in this episode is the views of Jordan and myself and not the views of Spaceworks or any other entity except us. Right on, man. Cool. So yeah, so thanks for making it on. Happy to have you here. Um, Fun hanging out with someone else that has similar dietary requirements before the show. <laughs> Both doing keto. Uh, not proud of it. Quite ashamed, but it is what it is. Obnoxiously so. We are yeah. we are those people who do keto and hang out on a podcast. Good to not feel like a <laughs> schmuck about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're definitely uh, definitely millennials. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's good to be here. Um, good to have you on. And, uh, yeah, just excited to learn a little bit more about what you do and some of the stuff you're allowed to talk about that you've, uh, you've been working on lately. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks again for having me, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. So what does the Investment and Transition Portfolio Manager do? Yeah, so uh, Spaceworks is a uh, government entity, uh, the innovation and investment arm of the Space Force. So we invest in dual use technology for both the commercial and the space markets. Um, so with that, we have a budget of about half a billion dollars that goes to startups annually. And of course, we hope that that technology eventually transitions to an actual customer. So these people are on a real contract selling real things to the government. Um, and with that, often a lot of our portfolio companies have private capital attached to it. So that's the investment piece and the transition piece was the first thing I said. So going from being like an SBA funded you know, to like a, just someone's actually buying this cause they want it. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And just a lot of the nature of these companies, they have of course, venture capital or private capital funding of, of some level. So that's was, an important part of our portfolio. So when I had Phil on, uh, Phil Han on uh, your colleague, yeah. I, I thought it was really interesting how you guys um, sort of validate um, market against investors. So you're like, if somebody's excited about this, then we are too, like we'll, we'll match, you know, your investment. What was uh, what was the logic behind doing that? Yeah, well, yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure about the the genesis of that, but I think what uh, what we're seeing is um, de-risks it from both parties. Um, you know, venture capital looks at deals differently. They go through a different due diligence process. They're much more worried about management team and path to profitability um, and scalability. Right, the government is much more interested in just pure technical merit and do we need this? Um, so if we get VC to be able to uh, validate those things, then on the government side, we can validate the technical expertise because we're having you know, maybe someone with a PhD in this very niche domain examine it versus a VC that they might have some you know, master's or PhD on staff looking at stuff, but probably not in that one specific domain. I've done tech diligence for VCs before. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, uh, it's really cool stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing in my wheelhouse. I'm not technically proficient like that, but you know, kind of a nice back and forth helps us de-risk it from from both parties. That's awesome. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think just the way you put it, you know, it's like yeah, I guess those are the incentives. <laughs> so I feel like I don't know. Like I'm not an expert on government contracting by any means, but it, it seems like finding that genuine dual use is is a bit of a a bit of a unicorn because. I mean, I guess I've seen some SBIR proposals where it's like, this is pretty contrived. Like, I don't think this is for anything except, you know, the military or like, I don't know. Like, I could see a commercial use case, but I'm not sure the, you know, the government use case really makes sense, you know. And yeah, space is, is a very interesting market because I feel like, um, and, you know, hopefully I don't say anything politically incorrect and we can edit it out if I do. But, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's kind of a limited market size a lot of the time, it, it, just where we are as humanity. So you almost need that government money to make it go. Like if I build, for instance, like a space bulldozer, you know, in order to funnel regolith into like a machine that processes it into oxygen, 
Like, what's really the market for that? Like, I'll sell one ever, like probably, like, maybe two or three, but like, I'm not going to sell that many. And if I try to dual use something like that and bring it back to earth, like now I'm competing with the billions of dollars that Caterpillar, John Deere, Dan Foss, Komatsu, you know, and, you know, Hyundai have sunk into their, you know, programs to make terrestrial optimized versions of that. So I, I feel like, like I said, it's like, it's tricky to find like a thing that really works in both settings. It's a good example of that. Yeah, I think there's a few good examples of it, but I think, you know, space as a whole is is hard, as everyone says. Yeah, well, the physics are different. I mean, it's like, how do you make that <laughs> yeah. useful on Earth most of the time? Yeah, and the time frames are completely different. Um, nearly everything other than pure software that's going to be used on some kind of hardware application in space is going to require a ton of capital expenditures for some very specific hardware thing. So the funding, the scalability is just quite different. Yeah. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. So what are some of the things you guys are invested in? Yeah, that's a good question. I think some of the coolest, I, I actually think most of the stuff we invest in is pretty sweet. Um, like in orbit refueling, um, like, you know, sending up fuel depots in low earth orbit or geostationary orbit or cislunar, but then some platform goes, fuels up and goes to some space asset or satellite to, you know, keep assets in space longer, uh, which is like just out of a sci-fi movie from like the eighties. Super cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, like re-entry capsules, um, you know, so you can send stuff up to low Earth orbit and they can do whatever they want commercially to go and manufacture in low Earth orbit and then bring it back. Um, old PNT technology, like, uh, which is al- alternative position navigation and timing. Oh, interesting. Um, so kind of uh, similar to GPS, but not GPS, either for redundancies or things that can't get jammed. Um, you know, I think the the biggest portfolio that's, under the United States Space Force is GPS, I, I think. Don't don't quote me on it. Um, sure. So, I mean, that's a pretty big, Jordan you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, good. Spencer. Uh, you know, so that's a pretty big deal. So, um, you know, technologies either that are here uh, on, on land or, um, you know, in, in low Earth orbit or elsewhere that um, do position navigation and timing. Um, that's another that's another cool one. Those are those are some of the things. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like you guys have a lot of irons in the fire. Yeah, I think, you know, strategically aligned with what the Space Force is doing, which, you know, similar to the Air Force being the, uh, you know, the best at the logistics of the sky, um, trying to figure out how to how to do logistics in space. Yeah. You know? That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I guess if you're going to maintain, like, a bigger fleet, you sort of need to start with our existing stuff and then build up from there the fueling one is particularly fascinating to me so i feel like just as a topic i mean that is well first of all like i mean i feel like you, sort of the rocket equation is working against you because it must take so much power just to get you know that mass of fuel up into orbit but i also don't fully understand it i mean i guess if you're bringing up like nuclear fuel maybe that doesn't apply as much or yeah i mean i'm not sure about about that specific point but i think if you think of like Let's just assume you can get like the fuel depot up there, good and fine. All of the other assets you can send up to space, you could either like now those assets don't need as much propellant, right? So you can trade mass propellant, you can trade propellant mass for those oh, for uh, payload mass, or now those assets just have less mass to them, so launch costs decrease, and you do that against enough assets, you might have made up your cost. Um, or lets you get different payload up there. Um, That's it. So you can kind of specialize more. And if you wanted to <laughs> assemble something in pieces that would need to fuel when it got there, you know, over multiple launches, that becomes more feasible if you can just get fuel up on its own. Yeah, and, and that, the, the only use case isn't just terrestrial of like trading propellant mass for payload mass or decreased launch costs, but um, you could also use, um, you know, refueling to keep things in orbit longer. Um, you know, if something 
loses propellant and it can't get to a graveyard orbit it's just going to come back to earth um, or create like unnecessary space debris that could create more issues so you know that's a possible way to lessen space debris by having more usable life and propellant to get these assets wherever they need to go to not create issues so i I think there's a few other use cases um that that might you know might make it worth it that's that's really interesting can i ask um like where are we at with grappling you know just out of control satellites at this point like do is that something we're still working on is like sending up a robot to just like grab a satellite and deorbit it yeah i mean a lot of people are looking at it um we had uh an effort called called orbital prime that was all about um space debris remediation so removing space garbage um i i think there are people developing like grappling hooks and arms you know to to do things many have like many use cases of grabbing space debris or doing um service assembly manufacturing of current assets in orbit um but i think as a whole the environment of space debris is pretty unknown from a policy standpoint of what one is and is not allowed to touch and bring back to earth oh that's interesting from a who owns what who can grab what there's there's a lot of policy questions that are still unanswered given that we haven't really you know done a lot of this before and space has never looked as congested and contested as it has today that's interesting yeah and it almost i mean i feel like in some ways it's like you know well, if you can get up there then you just own it is how it's always been but to your point i mean like now a lot of people can get up there and so yeah it, it's it's extremely democratized i mean you and i put some money together we can probably find you know someone to let us put some some payload on something cool maybe we'll send my ring oh there it is yeah, <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, yeah, I mean, it would probably not cost that much these days. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but you know, that again makes it pretty congested, and you know, heating up space is getting pretty privatized, and a lot of people are trying to test a lot of use cases up there, which is great. But there's still, you know, a lot of debris that at some point might create some pretty big difficulties. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, if you can clean that up, if you can deorbit just problematic crap, and if you can even figure out if you're allowed to grapple that crap in the first place, yeah, then um, you, know, you can maybe make it less of a less of a mess. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, you can probably make it less of a mess. I think there's there's such like small microscopic stuff too. I think um, astronauts now in the ISS when they do spacewalks, they're told to not um, like slide their arm. Oh, on stuff because there are so many tiny nicks that they might cut their glove so they need to like set it with intention and not slide it in fear that there might be you know some microscopic rip that happens as a result yeah which would compromise their suit it's mm-hmm. interesting how did you end up in this position yeah so i was with afworks for two years but i mean that transition from afworks to spaceworks of course makes a good bit of sense um but previous to that i did uh, tech M&A investment banking out in Seattle. Um, so that transition didn't make, and still doesn't make sense to a lot of people when I say it, but you know, we're investing in small businesses, many of whom like have private capital investment or many of whom who, you know, working with the government, a lot of government folks just don't have a lot of private sector experience specifically to seeing how businesses are run, how they're scaled, how they're sold, how they actually get to profitability and commercialization. Um, So I was brought on for that, but I actually had interned for Phil uh, way back in the day as an unpaid intern. Uh, Oh, cool. So working for Phil again, but this time I actually get paid, which is sweet. Nice. I don't know. I'm interested because I want to learn more about like, you know, like what you can do with investment and, you know, the private equity thing seems really interesting to me and. I don't know. I'm just, I just, you know, kind of as I, I grow up in my career and I, I see what other people are doing, I feel like it's like, oh, that's amazing. I didn't know you could do that. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. I wonder how I can apply that. <clears throat> There's some pretty cool stuff. I think, um, you know, debt financing is also having its time and has had its time for the last 
the last few years for for companies as another alternative to uh to venture capital equity investment is you know some good mezzanine debt or private credit yeah yeah that's been interesting um certainly have done that so it's good again keeps the cap table nice and clean yeah for sure and i mean yeah banks are are pretty easy to deal with despite you know like the um you know i feel like folk wisdom to the contrary like i don't know a healthy relationship with uh, huntington bank thanks guys <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, i don't know they've been nothing but a pleasure so yeah i mean as a whole i think um i wish more people knew what the sba could do um for folks i know just a very little bit but if i was going and having my own business i would go after like every sba thing possible that's interesting so what are some of the examples of stuff you can go after? I mean, we talked about SBIRs, which is small business innovation research contracts and people listening. Um, what are some of the other ones? Yeah, I think some of the traditional uh, debt financing that the SBA has, um, I think a, a really cool one I recently heard about is um, there's a, a specific loan for exports. So if you export things, um, it's a 90% loan guarantee. So you get a million dollars from, uh, you know, bank A for this program. You export some stuff. Of course, you have to show that you actually do export something. Um, you know, banks are probably going to underwrite and give you the loan because they're guaranteed nine hundred thousand yeah. dollars on the one million you gave, or what one million they gave you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So their risk is just way lower. So they're going to underwrite more loans. Yeah, I mean, they could give out. They could give out 10 of these. Yeah. For the same risk as one without the SBA. Exactly. Yeah, it makes sense. That was good math. Thanks. Yeah, I can, <laughs> I can still do basic arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, working in, working in tens is nice. No one really uses um, like metric time, right? Metric time? Isn't that a thing? Is that a thing? I think it's a thing. I didn't realize that was a thing. Well, I mean, I, I believe you. Our like, time's not base 10. Huh. Yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, I mean, lawyers try to make it base 10 by billing right. in six-minute increments. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the rest of us, it's just, you know, base 60, right? That's one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, well, I guess, yeah, 60 minutes uh, to an hour, 60 seconds to a minute. But then it gets weird because you've got, like, 24 hours in a day. And you're like, well, what the fuck happened there? Yeah, and seven days in a week. and Yeah, that's weird as well. And then, you know, a variable number of, you know, days and weeks in a month, depending on which month it is, which now you got to memorize 12 of them. And why are we back to 12 again? So I don't know. Yeah, it Just seems like 24, like that must be a thing. It's all, I guess it's multiples of six. No, because seven doesn't fit. Fuck. No, there's no logic to it. There's no logic to it. I, th <laughs> I, I don't know, but I think metric time does exist. Like, there's one engineer I've, I've heard about, um, and I won't say their name because, to be honest, I don't remember. I just heard the legend of this person. And <laughs> they'll pull, like, a 28-hour day just regularly. And they have to show up sometimes for, like, customer demos. And they'll <laughs> usually just be totally exhausted if the hours don't fit into their, you know, their working. Yeah. Like, where they're at at that point in time. Yeah, that doesn't leave a lot of room for unknown variables. But I guess if you're mostly an individual contributor and just have to get stuff done, it works out well so, enough. Yeah. Yeah, but like for meetings, you would be totally screwed. I mean, it just wouldn't, you wouldn't line up with anyone else. Yeah, but who needs meetings anyway? We do too many of them. Yeah, I suppose that's true. I feel like it's most of what I do anymore, though. Like with the role I found myself in, which is like sales and like management. It's like it's all meetings. And I, yeah. I like that. I like I'm extroverted. I enjoy it. Yeah, fair enough. I think everyone gets to a level that it's just uh, unavoidable. Yeah, it does get exhausting. Some Like I remember like, I've been trying to like sneak in my actual work between meetings and like that gets difficult because they all run up to each other and you're like, yeah, I can get one email in. And then you're like four minutes late and you're like, ah, I'm so sorry. I'm four minutes late. I apologize. Yeah. I, I think that's interesting. I, I wonder if people, if we're ever going to go back to what it was before, like remote work was just real. I think that's instilled like unrealistic expectations of how much time you can have between meetings. Like you don't have buffer time. Oh, that's interesting. Like, like, if you were able to drive, you could think through things. I mean, you might be able to get a couple of phone calls in on the drive, you know. Yeah, but as a whole, you're not really doing that much. Or even, like, if you're not even driving and just working in person all the time, 
Right. There's a walk down the hall. I mean, walk down the hall. You got like the little water cooler chat. Like your days has a little bit more built in like breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, I can see kind of the pros of, of, of each of those approaches. Right. Cause on the one hand, I mean, you can get more meetings in the other hand, you've gotten more meetings in like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like what, what are more meetings without there actually being a decent, like outcome or action for it. Yeah. Or if you just have so many meetings that you don't have time to do the work. Yeah. I suppose that's true. I mean, every meeting should have like, I feel like an agenda and like actions that come off the tail end or like, what the hell's the point? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like kind of the Amazon way, right? They try to like instill a very like top down. This is how we do meetings at Amazon. Yeah. I have heard, I don't, I, I guess, I don't know if you've like how much, what do you what do you know about it? So like what I one thing I heard was that there's like time for reading the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah, I, I think the um, like the thing that most people probably know about is like the Amazon six pager. Yeah. So like, I, I'm sure that there are plenty of teams in Amazon that don't do it, and I'm sure there are plenty of teams in other that, places that do. Yeah, or that use PowerPoint and places in Amazon that maybe don't. But my understanding of it is like PowerPoints prohibited. Um, not the good not the best way to like get information across um tons of time on like editing and getting things to look right so for meetings where like a decision needs to be made you write an amazon six pager which you know has background context lays out options lays out you know, maybe what will happen if you choose certain options you equip people with all the information they need so like me this is my meeting i own it i write the amazon six pager or you know, I don't work for Amazon, so I write the six pager. Yeah. Invite people to the meeting. The first like twenty ish minutes of the meeting spent silently. Everyone at the okay, table this is what I've heard about. Yeah, is yeah. just reading it, right? They're in ingesting mode, maybe the mark things up. And then, you know, question and decision time comes after it. So after they read all of it, you know, ask questions, have a dialogue, and then hopefully everyone's equipped enough from both the context of reading this document. And then also having some meaningful conversation about it that a decision can be made. I kind of like that because you've blocked out the time to read it. So you don't have to, I'm sorry, I couldn't get to it. I had another meeting. No, yep. it fucking, it's right there for you. You can, you can do that here. Yeah, exactly. I, and that's, I, I have thought of like, how would this work in a remote environment? And I, I don't would. think, I don't think it could ever be like read aheads. Like you would just have to say everyone for one hour, the but first 20 minutes, like, you, silent and reading time. Ahead. Yeah, exactly. Though I think the other thing is, like, you're going to get people multitasking remote than in person, which I the most people, for the most part, multitask when they're in. Like, unless it's one-on-one, -on -one, and, like, you, Spencer, will know if I'm, like, my eyes are, like, going all over the place on the screen. Yeah, I've tried to sneak it in, and it doesn't work. People know. Like, yeah. there's, there's a few meetings I have where it's a one-on-one, -on -one and I'll, I'll attempt to, like, you know, like, check my LinkedIn or, like... Yeah get an email in or like I'll get a text that's concerning and I'll, I mean like I don't know it happened earlier today when we were eating and like I got one and I'm like oh, yeah crap I gotta add I'm so sorry I, I feel horrible and you're like yeah whatever dude <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> um should we wrap it up I feel like we're we're in a good spot I feel like we yeah. need like maybe a unifying end message that's more metric time metric time <laughs> right. look it up <laughs> thanks for joining us today if you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.